Good afternoon and welcome back. My name is Alicia Kaufman. I'm Assistant Professor of History here at Baylor and one of the organizers of this conference along with Tommy Kidd and Philip Jenkins of the Institute for Studies of Religion. And I am here to introduce our second to the last session, um, our keynote from Anne Blue Wills. Anne Blue Wills is part of the Duke University contingent here and uh, parenthetically, whoever else you might have been rooting for last night, the Duke basketball game was a thing of beauty. Anne Blue Wills is Professor of Religious Studies at Davidson College with a BA in Religion from Davidson, MDiv from Yale Divinity School, and the aforementioned PhD in American Church History from Duke. Her most recent article, Heroes, Women, Wives, Writing Other Lives, draws on her biographical research about Ruth Bell Graham, wife of evangelist Billy Graham. And her new biography of Ruth Bell Graham is under contract with Erdman's. Um, and Anne also co-edited Billy Graham, American Pilgrim um, with Grant and Andrew Finstewin, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2017. Welcome, Anne. Thank you, Alicia. I was really just um, looking up the Davidson basketball score last night. Apparently the hotly contested Davidson-Cleveland state rivalry um, came out okay for the Wildcats, so um, we can all be happy today. Um, first, let me say good afternoon to you all. It's uh, lovely to see um, you all out there, hoping to hear something that's uh, edifying for you. And let me also thank Todd Still, who I met yesterday um, for this beautiful space and hosting us here. And um, of course, especially Byron Johnson and Tommy Kidd and Alicia Kaufman and Leon Miller, who uh, I think could organize academics <laughs> and does with um, amazing skill. So it's a real pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here and I've just enjoyed, this is my first visit to Waco and Baylor and I don't even want to go to Magnolia. <laughs> I'm enjoying my, my time over here, so. I guess I shouldn't say that. I might get y'all in trouble. All right, well, my title is Ruth Bell Graham in the Footprints of a Pilgrim. And I'm taking my title in part from Ruth's autobiographical book, Footprints of a Pilgrim, The Life and Loves of Ruth Bell Graham, published in 2001. I'm taking the liberty of recasting that title in light of our 2017 edited collection that Alicia mentioned, Billy Graham, American Pilgrim, Ruth clearly followed in her husband's footsteps, avoiding the limelight unless it served his evangelistic purposes, especially in the years when her children were young and at home. Yet continually as I write about her, I find myself having to reach outside the familiar language of helpmeet and submission to describe how her life proceeded. And in one of my classes this semester that is not about Ruth Graham or um, not, not focused especially on the history of American evangelicalism, we've just read Emily Hunter McGowan's new book, Quivering Families, and in that quiverful context, she describes how the language of submission and help meet, um, when it's rigidly construed, is an elite discourse anyway. So um, part of what I'm following when I'm looking at Ruth is how this discourse actually played out. To illustrate how I have decided to picture Ruth's life, I offer the old family circus cartoons, which you see an example here. Alistair, I saw you looking very closely at this. I'll tell you all you need to know about this. Um, and this is really just a shameless ploy to keep you awake after lunch, so. So this is a genre 
of family circus cartoons, right? This is not the only one that looks like this. Um, mom, cartoon mom, asks, this is Billy, to take out the trash or run to a neighbor's house for a cup of sugar. Cartoon Billy returns ages later, perhaps having left the trash in the driveway or the sugar next door. Cartoon Mom asks, what were you up to? And Cartoon Billy replies, nothing. Cartoonist Bill Keen illustrates the joke. Cartoon Billy has meandered from place to place, taking time to pet dogs and cats, satisfy his curiosity about the various goings-on of the neighborhood, exploring the workings of machinery, the contents of the trash. He's just playing. Um, this reflects something of a child's attention span and curiosity. This is um, not unimportant when we're talking about Ruth Graham. So as I think about her, uh, whose declaration of following Billy Graham, the pilgrim, is now a part of their well-honed marriage mythology. I think of her as Cartoon Billy, this Cartoon Billy. She embraced the myth of following him, yes, but she crammed an awful lot into the wake that Billy Graham made, including various dogs and neighborhood doings and machines and trash and play. In this presentation, I'll focus on several of these meanderings and try to make the case that Ruth, on her own, in that wake, in these footprints, holds interest for students of gender, women's history, and U.S. evangelicalism, um, namely in terms of what language, the, the hymn, um, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, what language shall I borrow to talk about what's happening as she meanders, um, and telling in U.S. evangelicalism a more complete story of women's work. Um, and because I have struggled with the language that's available to tell the story, I'm going to organize this um, talk according to some words that have marked these meanderings. So my first section um, I'm calling Nelson's words. During his years in the Chinese mission field, which extended from 1916 to 1941, this is, I'm sorry that this is not a better picture, but this just, you know, it's fun, uh, from a document, a, a book about the couple of generations of Presbyterian, Southern Presbyterian missionaries um, in this part of China when Nelson Bell and, and Virginia Bell were there from 1916 to 1941. Dr. Bell, Ruth's father, wrote almost daily letters home to Waynesboro, Virginia, to his mother, Mother Bell. Not Ma Bell, Mother Bell. Some of his wife's letters to her survive also, but there are many fewer from Virginia to Mother Bell. There are uh, there are probably thousands of letters from Nelson to his mother. Nelson recounted events in such detail that as you read these letters, their life unfolds almost like a novel. Mother Bell consistently follows up on all news. The letters knit together the far-flung relatives in a casual day-to-day -day exchange. The bulk of these letters come from after their return from an evacuation to the U.S. in 1927-28. They spent that year in part with Mother Bell in Virginia. Indeed, the daughter Virginia Bell, nicknamed Mai Mai, was born in June 1927 in Mother Bell's home. So part of Nelson's agenda in his letters was to keep his mother informed about this little baby's doings. As detailed as his letters were, however, a curious silence marked these words home. He usually wrote a word or two about Rosa, who was born in 1918. 
He rarely skipped an opportunity to describe the baby and her latest hijinks. But Ruth, born in 1920, is missing from these early accounts of the children's activities. In one report to his precious mother, Nelson noted that he stayed at home and did not go to the jail where they often tended to the prisoner's health needs. Quote, Virginia and Rosa went to church and I stayed with the baby, my my, unquote. He then goes on to describe what a lovely day it is. So we've got the family's doings and the weather. Not a word about Ruth. In a letter that opens with his account of performing minor surgery on his wife, Nelson wrote, quote, the children are growing so rapidly, unquote. He then details how many inches Rosa had grown over the past three months. I mean, this is quantifying, careful um, documentation. Moreover, he continued, the baby's arms and wrists are like little posts. Ruth is not mentioned. His silence typifies the 1929 letters, but continues beyond them. A 1930 letter gives full details about a lingering fever that had zapped Rosa's strength. The baby has been enjoying the swimming pool he had constructed on the mission compound grounds. I think I have a picture of the swimming pool. There they are. Um, Nelson sand, uh, and he talks about the cost of the pool and how much water it takes, how long it takes, how many people it takes to put water in the pool. He sandwiched in one brief sentence about Ruth recovering from a recent illness. And just to say, this is Nelson and Rosa, and that is Ruth back here, um, their bathing caps on, and they, um, they were relieved from the, the severe heat in Qingjiangpu, where they were mission, uh, doing their mission work by this very practical um, installation of a swimming pool. In a 1931 letter describing Rosa's 13th birthday party, Nelson detailed his own costume, as well as what Rosa, the teacher, Lucy Fletcher, nurse Cassie Lee Oliver, Virginia, Bessie Woods, who was married to his mission coworker, what they all wore for their costumes. But he was again completely silent on Ruth, neither including her in the fun-loving costumed ranks nor explaining her absence. Even mentioning that Ruth joined the church on Sunday the 6th of April, 1930, dropped out of Nelson's catalog of the family's news. He did not mention the event in letters written on the 9th of April or the 11th of April, nor did he note any preparations in letters before the Sunday in question. Only a week later, did he ask his mother, quote, did I write you that Ruth joined the church on last Sunday? She went with me before the session and stood a good examination. I had to interpret most of the questions for her as she does not understand a lot of the theological terms in Chinese, unquote. The baby, my my, was cute and lovable, and Rosa was a standout in her schoolwork her spiritual life, her attitude, her helpfulness, anything less than that, and most anything would have been less than that, seemed hard for Nelson and Virginia to credit. In describing, not exactly praising Ruth as quite an artist who can draw such pretty etching scenes, Nelson wrote to his father that, quote, it has never been a talent I have especially desired for a child of mine. Rosa is quite studious and reads a great deal, unquote. Clearly, he valued the intellect over the artistic. What accounted for his avoidance? There are some clues. Describing a trip in Shanghai to Shanghai in early 1930, Nelson reported that only Ruth came along with him and Virginia while Rosa stayed with missionary colleagues and friends, the Montgomery family, who worked at a nearby station. Mai Mai, the baby, stayed at the woods, their co-workers who worked with them at Qingjiangpu. Ruth, he wrote, is sensitive, and we feared she might have her feelings hurt down in Huayan with Rosa and get all worked up, so we brought her along. 
She's a great mother's baby, anyway. Hates to leave us for a minute, unquote. Mother Bell must have expressed some concern for Ruth because Nelson explained somewhat contradictorily in a later letter, quote, no, Ruth is not one bit nervous about conditions out here. Neither of the children are, but she's sensitive and we did not like to leave her and Wyon with the possibility of her not being thoroughly happy all the time, unquote. I wonder what the specific difference is between being nervous and being sensitive. When a few years hence, Ruth experienced acute homesickness during her first months at school in Pyongyang, Virginia remembered that she was always anxious to come home after a few days in Wyan, and she would often refuse to go. Home was very important to Ruth from early on. Beginning in 1932 and, and moving into the, the pre-college years, Nelson did begin to write more about Ruth and write a little bit more appreciatively of her talents and her temperament. At the end of 1932, Nelson described a splendid play that the children presented the week before. The focus of the action was the, quote, conversion of a Jewish family in New York, unquote. As usual, Nelson lavished praise on Mai Mai but then uncharacteristically turned to commend Ruth to Mother Bell. Quote, Ruth carried the heaviest part and did it so well. She is such a scamp, so full of fun and life, unquote. She had also designed the program's cover illustration, which is not in the archive, but which he sent to his mother. But he also fretted, quote, I fear she will be too popular at school, unquote. By 1932 then, at least in Nelson's eyes, Ruth seemed to be coming into her own with this energy and perhaps charm. Um, it would be a lot to handle in a seven or eight year old, but maybe as she um, hit the teenage years was, was a little easier to be around. So those are Nelson's words um, and a few of Virginia's words about Ruth. So let's turn to, to God's word. Although her previous academic record reflected less than stellar performance, one reason maybe that Nelson did not write much about her early on, Nelson reported at the end of 1932, quote, Ruth is doing so well at school this year, making excellent marks and showing evidence of real study and work. A year later, reflecting again on Ruth's academic journey, he wrote, Quote, Ruth was slow in starting, but the last two years she did well in her books, unquote. Rosa was a hard academic act for Ruth to follow, but by late 1933, Nelson had accepted and even begun to lovingly appreciate that fact. So late August 1932 um, brought Rosa's departure from Qingjiangpu in order to attend the Pyongyang Christian School in what is now North Korea. And as I was listening to Helen's presentation this morning, I, I couldn't help but think that uh, part of the power for Billy to be in um, Korea um, was the connection that Ruth had to, um, to North Korea, um, was still unified when she was there. So back in 1932, Nelson and Ruth accompanied Rosa to, um, to school at, at Penyang. It's a trip of almost 2,400 miles. On their way, they attended in Shanghai what the former professional baseball prospect, Nelson Bell, called a jam-up good baseball game between a Japanese college team and a squad of U.S. Marines. Nelson also shared his view of the teachers in Shanghai at the American school there. The Bells were pointedly not sending Rosa or Ruth to school there. The Shanghai teachers, he wrote, had bobbed hair and were painted. They wore makeup. But the Pyongyang teachers, quote, had long hair and no sign of paint, and their general attitude was what one would want for one's children to have as teachers, unquote. Pyongyang's teachers, moreover, had been educated at Moody Bible and Biola. 
Even the normally suspect Northern Presbyterians at Pyongyang gained Nelson's approval because they backed Gresham Machen's anti-modernist Westminster Seminary. They were therefore good sound people. He says, I never saw anything like Pyongyang's vibrant Christian community. He was very enthusiastic about sending them to school there. So Ruth followed Rosa in the fall of 1933 and was desperately homesick, sick homesick the first year, begging repeatedly in just pitiful letters to her parents to come and take her back to Qingjiangpu. And I've included here, I don't know if you can see this, um, but I'll read it to you, one of her poems, and I'll talk more about her poems in a minute, um, that is published in Footprints, um, Footprints of a Pilgrim, that gives you a sense of early adolescent misery, heartache. Spare not the pain, though the way I take be lonely and dark, though the whole soul ache, for the flesh must die, though the heart may break. Spare not the pain, oh spare not the pain. That is just about the saddest thing I've ever read. And this is from a 13-year-old girl. So, you know, go back in your minds with me for a moment to 13 and being away from almost everything you've ever known or loved. Um, and you're sensitive or you're nervous um, and and you also know that your parents are doing this, sending you away um, to prepare you for your life of Christian service. Um, it's just heartbreaking. Um, but she, with the help of uh, the women's dean, at the, the girls' dean at the school, and um, some support from some of the younger students, Ruth finally acclimated to Pyongyang and was able to flourish there. Um, she was there for three years. In this decade, uh, the decade of the 30s, the Bells were debating for most of the decade where to send their daughters for college. Um, and Wheaton, outside, Wheaton College outside of Chicago was the fastest growing college in America at the moment gaining accreditation and drawing increasing numbers of students, building a pace. So when Ruth arrived, joining Rosa in late 1937, the place was thriving. Wheaton appealed to the Bells for a variety of reasons. Its evangelical bona fides were impeccable. The college continued to insist on training in Bible for every student and expected all to demonstrate personal conduct and social commitment befitting young Christian women and men. And two, the school also encouraged the regular fun of college life. And I think this was important also to Nelson and Virginia. No Greek life, but Wheaton had a long tradition of literary societies beginning in 1855 with the founding of what became the Beltonian Association. I'm probably not pronouncing that in the secret style of pronunciation. These were co-ed debate societies. At the turn of the century, like many other US colleges, Wheaton fielded its first football team. And the attendant festivities followed, parades and pep rallies and a marching band. The Bells had seriously considered sending Rosa to college closer to Mother Bell in Waynesville, Virginia, to Mary Baldwin College, specifically Virginia's alma mater. But Virginia worried, no matter where they went, she worried about sending her girls away. Quote, little do they know the force of evil at home. Nelson expressed their strong preference for a Southern school where racial and social conventions would be more to their liking. And they must have eventually decided that Wheaton's theological rigor would restrain what they would, the Bells would have considered race radicalism. Nelson wrote, quote, I am convinced that in these days, 
an institution cannot simply stand for the right or try to take a neutral position. Satan, Nelson warned, is actively fighting through men and women unfaithful to God and his word, and we must fight back in his power, unquote. He said, I like the way Wheaton makes its unequivocal stand for God, the Bible, the Savior, and clean, honest, moral living, unquote. Well, there's no surprise in me telling you that Ruth would rather have finished at Pyongyang and returned to live at Qingjiangpu until assuming her mission post, she hoped to be a missionary to Tibetan nomads, of all things. In Footprints of a Pilgrim, she wrote, quote, I argued to, to her parents that all I needed was a utilitarian knowledge of Tibetan and the Bible. I certainly didn't have to sail halfway around the world for that. My parents simply smiled and put me on a boat to the United States. I was not happy, unquote. So off she went. Nelson planned her course schedule, quote, with no mathematics if possible. He's a nice man. Um, he described Ruth as a student as rather a plotter, not a bright student. Her ambition, continued, after all, to be mission work in Tibet. So she studied Bible, majored in it, and art. Lest we forget, these committed young Christians at Wheaton were college students. So this is, and I, again, I apologize for the quality of the pictures. Um, this is a, a yearbook, Wheaton Tower yearbook, um, the cover page with the theme for 1939, which would have covered the years 37, 38. And the words here say, romance, research, relaxation, reviewers, renewal. And you've got accompanying pictures that purport to illustrate all of those themes. We cannot forget that romance constituted at least one fifth of a college student's day. Harold Lenzel, a senior, a man about campus, eight years older than Ruth, had fallen desperately in love with her during her first year. Nelson reported this to his mother, the girls had told him, and he said, quote, we hope things will not get too serious now and have written Ruth fully in regard to it, unquote. Aside from that romantic pursuit, Ruth participated in International Club and the Rural Bible Crusade, and notably, future Tibetan missionary, the Foreign Missions Fellowship, which promoted close association of students looking forward to missionary service on the foreign field. They gathered for prayer, they raised funds for current missionaries, they hosted speakers, and they evangelized off campus. One of Ruth's less solemn pursuits was in the newly created Dixie Club, among, those, among whose 100 odd members she was pictured in this yearbook. Oh, actually, it may have been the next year. The club, quote, was organized to maintain Southern customs and ideals, to promote social unity among the members, and to uphold the high Christian standards of Wheaton College, unquote. From what I can tell, uh, the one year that this club appeared in the, in the tower, they um, did a lot of eating, uh, things like grits and patty sausage, which I wasn't aware was a southern delicacy. Um, they had some recreational outings, they went skating, things like that. Um, and as I said, it may not have lasted more than a year. There's um, some digging to be done there. It's only appearing in one, of, one issue of the tower yearbook. The lore of Ruth meeting the Baptist preacher come to Wheaton from a Bible college in Florida is well known. After their first introduction, Bill invited Ruth to a campus concert. The chemistry was powerful between these two young, beautiful people. Ruth, as the story goes, returned from that date, quote, knelt on the carpet beside her bed in her room at the Scott House and prayed, God, if you let me serve you with that man, I'd consider it the greatest privilege of my life, 
unquote. Still determined to be of Christian service, she struggled with the new complicating factor of romantic passion. Could he become part of her vocation? Or could she transfer her own ambitions for arduous Christian service to someone else's project? For Ruth, love was not simply about desire or compatibility. It was also about a joint commitment to serving God. She had witnessed her parents living out that layered kind of relationship. And Wheaton's presentation of romance reinforced the desirability of finding a life partner in Christian vocation. All of these heady concerns co-occurred with the petty, fickle, feelings on the fly features that typify young passion. After much struggle, internally and with him, she confessed, quote, somehow I need him. I don't know what I'd do if, for some reason, he should suddenly go out of my life, unquote. She was willing to be, quote, a lost life, lost in Bill's life. Self-extinguishing love, perhaps a familiar concept in a tradition focused on a God who died for the sake of others. Yet after he presented her with an engagement ring, she almost immediately regretted telling him she would marry him. Patsy Cornwall gives this, um, this little snippet of conversation. Listen, Billy said, do you or do you not think the Lord brought us together? Yes, she had to confess. Then, he said firmly, I'll do the leading and you'll do the following. As Ruth would later remark, Cornwall writes, with mischief in her eyes, I've been following him ever since. Some of you may have seen uh, a documentary where she tells the story, Ruth tells the story. To watch this filmed interview is to see her repeat a well-worn tale as if she were a political candidate giving a stump speech for the umpteenth time. The final line delivered in this film by a long married woman showed her affirming Bill as the head of their relationship. She had followed him into the marriage, into a two-person career that she never aspired to, into the spotlight. Yet the mischief that Cornwall notes belied Ruth's embrace of traditional marital hierarchy and quiet following. She had resisted the role of submissive helpmeet and the mischievous look revealed a self-conscious cultivation of her own mind. He had himself followed her to Montreat where she established their residence built their home, and reared their children. And I'll say more about that now with one word, never. In 1945, with Bill traveling extensively for Youth for Christ, Ruth moved to Montreat, North Carolina, where her parents had settled in 1941 after leaving China permanently. In December of 1947, Bill somewhat reluctantly accepted the post of president at the Northwestern schools. As Bill Martin writes, quote, when a school administrator called to ask when she would be moving to the president's mansion, Ruth gave a clipped and accurate answer, never, unquote. I realized, Ruth later mused to Marshall Frady in an interview, quote, that he was going to be gone most of the time. In a case like ours, I believe the family is the Lord's business, but a husband should have his wife settled where she's going to be happy. Well, he had nothing to do with it. She moved them there. Montreat, or more particularly, wherever her parents were, was the place for Ruth to be happy. After about 10 years of living on Assembly Drive, Montreat's main drag, with the Bells and then in a cottage across a side street from the Bells, 
Ruth purchased an impossibly rugged cove up the mountain and set about building a house. Now this purchase happens, and I made this connection um, this morning while Uta was talking about the Greater London Crusade. She accompanied him against her will, tried to return early, he canceled her tickets, um, and you know, kind of took her prisoner, would not let her return home to her very small children. Um, so she was gone most of that summer. Um, she was there with him. And she wrote in her diary during that summer, 1954, quote, I surrendered for the obscurity of the mission field. I surrendered for the obscurity of the mission field. I thought the height and depth of surrender was to lose myself, that language again, in heathen obscurity for God. I find my surrender was neither high enough nor deep enough. All summer, I have rebelled at this publicity, this phenom that's storming through London. I belong to God, and he placed me here, and he will undertake for me and give me poise, grace, love, wisdom, all I need to bring him honor in the life he has appointed, unquote. That's as heartbreaking as the, the poem to me. Um, so she buys this property um, coincident with the, the Greater London Crusade. Even before construction begins, Ruth created a swimming hole on the property by damming up the mountainside's stream. She intended to be the house's architect, in practice the counter-architect, but ended with an architect from Jackson, Mississippi and a local contractor. In the first of many negotiations with her, they talked her out of a two-story home, which they said would look like a skyscraper on the site that they had selected. She and a friend, I think this is her neighbor, Betty Frist, scoured the coves and valleys around the Swannanoa, looking for building materials, log cabins, whether intact and inhabited or abandoned and ruined. Um, all of this were, was fair game as she gathered logs and old furniture and old fixtures and hardware for this project. On occasion, she traded new items for old, leaving mountain folk puzzled as to why such a nice, tidy lady would want such old junk. She countered the architectural specs repeatedly with her own strong preferences. She countered Billy's preferences with her preferences. The vision she had of what the house would be extended beyond the design and the layout into its finishes, so she directed the stonemasons and the carpenters to keep their work rough looking. And some of them resisted this instruction because they were proud of their work and they didn't want to let it, they didn't want it to look like they didn't know what they were doing. But that was what Ruth wanted, a home that looked as if it had been on the side of that mountain for generations. Her genetic capacity for repurposing whatever was at hand does not completely or adequately explain why Ruth built a log cabin. The daughter of parents who built their own swimming pool on the Chinese outback, created the family's wardrobe from the missionary barrels hand-me-downs, devised effective treatments for endemic diseases, and fashioned a dry cereal maker from an old mortar shell, one of Nelson's famous inventions. Ruth, too, came, uh, used what came to hand, mountain streams, mountain cabins, to make a home for her family. Instead of joining the mid-century movement to the new suburbs that pretended to be the autonomous homestead in the countryside, Ruth actually built one. The structure, this log home, countercultural, neither suburban nor mid-century modern, reassured her as the world beyond Montreat's Gate sped up. 
a historian of log structures, a person by the name of C.A. Westlaker, described log cabins as practical but provisional housing for frontier dwellers. You could put it up quickly and easily. Ruth intended this house to be it. She did not build this house for the short term or for part-time use. She settled in Montreat permanently, never moving to Minneapolis or anywhere else. She built security, she built privacy, she built a refusal of conformity. Um, let me just say a word about this picture and this next picture are illustrations from a, a children's book, it's a pretty sophisticated children's book, like for a 10, 11, 12 year old um, called One Wintry Night that Ruth worked on. She had originally told the story and then um, a different version was issued um, 20 years later with these gorgeous illustrations by Richard Jesse Watson. Um, of course, this is the, the cabin in the distance and the snow um, falling quietly. And then this is an interior of the um, kind of famous, I guess, living room with the hearth um, and the, the mantelpiece with uh, a mighty fortress is our God carved in this. The resulting house could not have been more different from what most young white families in the mid-1950s moved into during the post-war baby and housing boom. The design that dominated U.S. residential development after the war was the open plan ranch house. Ranch, you know, a, a different kind of nostalgia than this, what's going on here. Ruth eschewed both that mass-produced housing solution and the mid-century style that was experimenting with man-made materials like steel and formed concrete. Uh, another housing experiment that I have stumbled upon in the course of this research is the Playboy's penthouse apartment. Uh, the plans for this um, pad, this bachelor pad, ran in Playboy magazine in September and October 1956, just as the Grahams were moving into this house. Um, it was sleek, the manly touches of stone and wood, uh, created a space that was dedicated to indoor pleasures, but not domestic pleasures, if you get my drift. Little Piney Cove, this house, is neither the feminized suburban home of Levittown, for instance, nor the modern sophisticates glass and steel cube, the, the bachelor pad of the penthouse apartment. Uh, historian Joel Sanders talks about a manly environment in building in the mid-century that was created through rugged natural materials. The feminine spaces featured softer materials, patterns and textures sometimes laid over one another. Ruth is making a place um, where she can be comfortable, where the children can be comfortable, where Bill can be comfortable. And she may have also been trying to recreate something like the house she'd grown up in, the feel of that compound in Qingjiangpu. Just as Nelson and Virginia had gloried in the exploits involved in living and working in a more isolated part of the mission field, so Ruth may have wanted some semblance of self-sufficiency in the mountains of North Carolina. In a profile of Ruth that ran in the magazine Woman's Day, I think this was in 1970, Ruth said, quote, I have a strong sense of the presence of Christ in this house, and it gives me an unreasonable sort of joy, unquote. And that phrase is striking. Um, and I, I did some poking around. It may be from a late 17th century Puritan sermon um, a genre that Ruth loved and read and collected. Um, this unreasonable sort of joy of having the sense of the presence of Christ in her house. So let me um, turn to some public words. Ruth never enjoyed public speaking, of course. But as her five children left home for school and marriage and their own families, 
she did develop more of a public voice in print and in person. The profile in Woman's Day is one example of this more public um, facing Ruth. One appearance that is documented, she was the honoree at a woman's luncheon the day before a crusade began in Anaheim, California in September 1969. The Christian Times and the Washington Post ran stories that fairly swooned about the occasion, reporting on the event as, quote, one of the greatest public tributes ever accorded any woman anywhere, unquote. I mean, just like the, the accolades are just pouring out of that. Um, over a ladylike meal of fruit and cottage cheese, quote, the largest assemblage west of the Rockies that had been served such a luncheon at one time, unquote, 11,000 women watched, some through closed circuit television, as Ruth dispensed practical advice on marriage and child rearing. Featured with her on the dais were um, Nancy Reagan, then First Lady of California, and President Nixon's sister-in-law, plus her daughter Bunny and Bunny's mother-in-law. Similar practical advice ran in a feature on Ruth in the spring of 1970 in the run-up to a Knoxville crusade. Relying on her understanding of the Bible's instructions to women, Ruth advised women to marry men they don't mind adapting to. Get out your pencils, ladies, come on. Quote, the primary goal in a woman's life, she instructed, is to make her husband happy, not to make him good. Only God can make him good. Shall I say that again? Did you get it? The primary goal in a woman's life is to make her husband happy, not to make him good. Only God can make him good. This forbearing attitude extended to her teenage children. She said, I listen to what they say. They're not always right. They're not always right but sometimes they are, she said. Her children, she explained, were allowed to argue with her and Bill as long as they did so respectfully. This freedom gave her children, she said, better sense than young people who protested by throwing rocks. The comment might seem out of place until one considers that the violent protests at Kent State University had occurred several weeks previously coming to a deadly climax on May 4th, 1970. The fatal clash that day included several rounds of heavily armed National Guard troops facing off against rock-throwing student protesters. Ruth did not mention Kent State explicitly, but her dismissive comment indicted the student pro protesters and implied that she thought they may have gotten what they asked for by not following the National Guard's orders to disperse. Her own children, she noted, had been, quote, brought up with a profound respect for the law, unquote. Protesting was fine, she averred, but she said, I don't think rock throwing or abusive language is respectful or shows good sense, unquote. Now, to me, her exhortations there sound at best insensitive and square, but she tempered her views by reminding the Knoxville newspaper's readers that while God never promised it would be easy to follow Christ, she says, God loves us just as we are. Her message was uncompromising. Quote, we are spiritually dead until we accept the life he has to offer, unquote. She had a clear sense of human failure, but also of God's compassion. She would bring the hammer down in Jesus' name, but she also persisted in calling on divine mercy. So now I wanna talk about three sub-episodes um, of her public words. And I'm thinking here about um, the measure of political impact as important, which is just a standard um, of the patriarchy that equates public space with reality and what matters. Um, and these were statements that Ruth made that happened to be public that tell us something about who Ruth was, but I'm not trying to argue that Ruth matters because she was a political agent in the, in the way that we may normally hear that. Um, so first, 
um, with all deference to Alistair, who um, knows, knows everything there is to know about Lausanne, um, I want to talk for a second about Lausanne um, over a word. The International Congress on World Evangelization in July 1974 in Lausanne um, aimed to chart a path for bringing the gospel to the modern world around the world. One outcome, as Alistair described, of the meeting was the Lausanne Covenant, a 15-part systematic theology in mi miniature for the mission-minded. The statement clarified its signatory's understanding of God and scripture, Jesus Christ and his expected return, the Holy Spirit, the church worldwide, and its cooperative mission both to evangelize and show compassion in Christ's name. Section 9 of the covenant, titled The Urgency of the Evangelistic Task, confessed the church's guilt in not yet spreading the gospel through all the world. The, the statement reads, we cannot hope to attain this goal without sacrifice. All of us are shocked by the poverty of millions and disturbed by the injustices which cause it. The sacrifice enjoined upon the covenant signers was this, quote, those of us who live in affluent circumstances accept our duty to develop a simple lifestyle in order to contribute more generously to both relief and evangelism, unquote. This component of the covenant rubbed Ruth the wrong way, and she let John Stott know it. Ruth told Lois Firm in a 1978 interview, quote, I quarrel with John Stott on this simple lifestyle business. I said, if only you'd put an ER on the end of it, simpler. Because what is simple for one person is complicated for another. What is the only way that Bill can get his work done would be unbearably complicated for some people. But if he lived like, say, George Bergen, who was a local Black Mountain man famous for his super simple living, frankly, she said, he couldn't get his work done, unquote. Pragmatist, tunnel vision, she, she insisted Christians need not be drab or frumpy or um, self-abnegating to the point that they can't be contributing. Um, they can't be evangelizing. If so, if they go to those extremes, she thought, they risked alienating the very people they hoped to attract. And she boiled this exhortation about evangelism in the world down to how it would affect one person, Bill, who needed the seclusion, the live-in secretary, the separate outbuilding for a study. She was ardent in his defense and had a kind of tunnel vision for his well-being and for the well-being of his vocation. So that's one word, the simple or simpler. Um, Richard Nixon, a kind word. Richard Nixon, forced to resign from the presidency under pressure of impeachment for his role in the Watergate break-in, left the White House, of course, in August 1974, humiliated and physically broken. A troublesome blood clot returned with a vengeance after his return to his California home. Um, and he was hospitalized for a second time in late October and underwent surgery that some feared he would not survive. While recovering, he refused to see any visitors. He confessed to his wife, Pat, that he thought he was going to die. He had nothing to live for, he told her. One day, a nurse wheeled Nixon from his windowless room to an adjacent one so that he could see what was happening in the bright California sky. A small plane flew nearby, trailing behind it a banner that declared, Nixon, God loves you, and so do we. In his 1990 memoir, the former president wrote that he learned later that Ruth Graham and some of her friends had arranged it. Ruth, who was at this point recovering from her own serious injuries from a fall, acted with a perfectly improbable combination of publicity and anonymity. 
the pragmatic tunnel vision recurs. She tried to make not a political statement, but a personal one. Leary, perhaps, of publicly demonstrating a close connection between the ex-president and her husband, she decided on an extravagant plan of action. Oh yeah, I'll get a plane. A spectacular secret. Nixon credited the sign and other signs of personal support for helping him survive after the surgery. He said, without such expressions of love, I would not have made it. One, one last um, bit of, of words, and I don't know how I've gotten to 2.30 already, but I won't torture you much longer. So, fighting words. A very warm late May day in 1975 in Charlotte, North Carolina, kicked off the nation's bicentennial celebrations. President Gerald Ford paid a visit to help commemorate Mech Deck Day, the 200th anniversary of Mecklenburg County's purported early declaration of independence from Britain. Ford was not the only one uh, aus uh, auspicious presence uh, in attendance. Also, the governor was there, there was a state representative, and the county's famous homegrown evangelist. They all peopled the stage in downtown Freedom Park. The latter preached. The Charlotte Observer story delivered only a few lines from his message, quote, our nation in 1975 is in deep trouble, he intoned. I would die for my faith in God and I would die for that flag back there, unquote. Sign carrying protesters apparently kept quiet during the religious service part of the program. When Ford took the podium several hours later, the scene had shifted. One protester bearing a sign that read, eat the rich, and on the reverse, don't tread on me, stood in the row behind Ruth's first row seat. On what she said was an instinctive impulse, the observer reported, Ruth pulled the sign from his hands and placed it under her white pump shoes where he could not easily or gracefully retrieve it. Unaware of her identity, the young man, one Don Pollock, age 28, identified as a woodcarver by profession, knelt to ask for the sign back. Quote, he looked rather helpless and harmless, she recalled. Quote, I just patted him on the shoulder and shook my head. She treated him, in other words, as she would have treated her sons in the aftermath of one of their pranks. I'm the mother of five children, she declared, and disrespect has never been tolerated. What he did was disrespectful. He had a right to his opinion, she observed, but when the President of the United States is speaking, it is definitely not the place to express his opinion, unquote. Audience members around her were turning to see his sign instead of attending to Ford's words. So police moved Pollock away from the stage, blocking his view of the president and ordering him to stay back under threat of imprisonment. Well, he filed simple assault charges against Ruth, accusing her of pushing him. When the case finally reached Mecklenburg District Court, Ruth appeared wearing a pink and green suit. Her wardrobe was an evergreen story flanked by two attorneys. Was someone worried that she would take the jail sentence instead of paying a fine as she had vowed to do? The judge dismissed the charge, finding no evidence to support assault. Ruth and the erstwhile protester then walked out of the courtroom side by side. A news account reported, quote, as they neared the door, Mrs. Graham pulled a brown Bible from her pocketbook and tried to hand it to him. In response, Pollock smiled, but passed on the peace offering. Ruth then said, I'll be praying for you. Um, I wanted to talk about um, one of Ruth's poems. There, there are a couple of hundred of her poems. Um, but I think in the interest of time, I will um, skip over that since I've already shown you a couple of those. The, the poem was 
uh, it's called Sitting by My Laughing Fire. It's the title poem in the collection that was published in 1977. And her poetry is just another, uh, just uh, another component of an increasingly public Ruth. Um, and while if you are a poetry snob, um, you might not enjoy reading her work. Uh, I, I think it rewards some attention um, and uh, recommend it to you. This is my favorite picture of Ruth. I just have to include that because I love it so much. Um, she's just so beautiful. Um, I've written, okay, this is my conclusion. Um, and my conclusion is titled, No Words. I've written elsewhere about the Graham family battle over Ruth's final resting place. Nancy Gibbs and Michael Duffy and Laura Sessions Stepp followed the argument as it was happening, which came right at the end of Ruth's life in 2007. Some of her children supported a long ago decision to have pa both parents interred at the Cove Training Center in Asheville near Chatlos Chapel when the time came. Others wanted them to be buried at the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte, which was just getting ready to open its doors as Ruth's health steeply declined. She had no life connection to Charlotte. She disdained the circus atmosphere of the library, and she dictated a statement that, quote, under no circumstances am I to be buried in Charlotte, North Carolina, unquote. She is in fact buried in Charlotte, North Carolina. Incidentally, just to, to follow the theme, Bill followed her and was buried there last February, as we all know. Under the influence of her elder son's determination to solemnize the library with a prayer garden containing her and Bill's remains, and her husband's determination to see the library used as a tool for Christian evangelism, she agreed to follow their plan. She submitted. But she was Ruth, to and beyond the end. Her massive grave marker famously reads, end of construction, thank you for your patience. An accompanying signboard, who explains a joke? Next to the grave, explains that Ruth noted this roadside message once and thought it was appropriate for her and perhaps anyone's epitaph and it in fact appears in Footprints of a Pilgrim. Um, she submitted to burial at the library but with this epitaph she also did a little outwitting in the process and some of you may know one of her um, one of the things that is attributed to Ruth is, there's a time to submit and a time to outwit. So with this epitaph, she did a little outwitting as she submitted. She subwitted. She outmitted. There are no words for what she did. No words. She may have hoped that the appearance of the Chinese character for righteousness at the top of the stone would end the contest. No English words, but this character. The sovereign God asked, what have you been up to? Cartoon Ruth, the Ruth of help meet myths answered, nothing. Just walking home, just loving creatures, just preparing to be a missionary just creating a home and trying to protect my kids, just writing some poems, just trying to love my friends and family and keep people in line, but in the end, just trying to love others. Thank you. Would you have time for a few questions? Please come up to the microphone so they will be recorded. The question came up earlier today, who had a strong influence on Dr. Graham when it came to world, 
whether his trips overseas. Would you speak about this missionary daughter with a heart for missionary and wife, the influence she would have mm -hmm. on her husband as he proceeds overseas, both politically and spiritually? Oh, that's a great question. And there are, um, the, the dam in my brain is breaking um, with, with a couple of, of things to point to and a couple of, of things that I can't speak to. I mean, just as Billy's career outside of the United States is a completely separate subject almost, I mean, not a completely separate subject, but that's a whole new wing of the library that has yet to really be um, figured out. And so Alistair and Uta and Helen are um, helping to kind of create that, uh, the field. Um, I have not done um, as much as I should have or would like to with Ruth and her travel. Um, sometimes she traveled with Billy and sometimes she didn't and she preferred not to, but of course there are several trips um, to China and to Korea that um, are, are documented and are important to her because that's her, that's her place. Um, and she, she said several times during her life that the mountains of North Carolina, um, that was her, her home, but she really, her home was in China where she had been born. And barring, you know, the ability to go back there, she planted herself in a place that reminded her of that landscape and um, the, the kind of seclusion um, of, that, of that place. I know that, um, just thinking about her political influence on him, and there are others in this room who, who can speak more clearly about this than I can, but she um, didn't, she, of course she and Billy did not always agree, and there were some key moments where they disagreed, and one was his trip to Moscow. She did not want him to go. Um, and I, I think, and others again may, may have other, other information or other thinking about this, but her, uh, her father was such an important influence on her um, in, in terms of theology and in terms of politics. And uh, was, he was um, vigilantly anti-communist till the day he died. And one, I mean, he, he was suspicious of the Northern Presbyterians usually because he felt like it was a communist plot. Um, so her, her antenna were extremely well and probably over sensitive to um, the, the dangers of communistic thinking. Um, and I think that was part of why she worried that, that he shouldn't go. And part of it was that she just, from the, from the first moment of their marriage, when he accepted the job at Western Springs, she could not let him forget that she, he was an evangelist. She gave up her dream for his evangelism, not for his um, pastorate not for his political aspirations, not for his movie stardom, not for his television show hosting. She did not give up her dream for that. Um, so her, her reining him in, I think, also reminded him that uh, evangelism, that was, that was what he was called to do. Um, I don't know if I'm, am I speaking to your, I'm speaking to your question. It is fascinating to me that, and I was saying this to somebody last night, Billy talked about Dr. Bell as so influential, the most influential person in his life. And yet they, 
I don't want to say they couldn't have been more different. There are ways they could have been more different, but they were so different. Um, Dr. Bell, and I, I have friends in, in uh, Davidson where I live whose relatives were in the field with the Bells, and so their family lore is so interesting to hear in contrast to the, um, the lore of the Bell mission work. Um, Nelson Bell was difficult to get along with. He, if he saw um, an asymmetry, he went right for it and argued um, to straighten that out. And that's just not, um, I mean, Alistair's given us some, some things to think about in that regard, but um, Billy was so able to either avoid getting into the asymmetry in the first place or, um, you know, working it out. And that just, uh, Dr. Bell thrived on that conflict. And so it's, it's um, just so intriguing to me to think about what, okay, what was the influence? Because um, it certainly wasn't, you know, diplomacy skills. That was not where it, where it came from. Thank you for your talk. Oh, you're um, welcome. My question, it's kind of more of a pastoral one. My girlfriend is um, currently living in Huayan, China. She lives and works there. And last week, she was at the rededication of the Ruth Graham Bible Institute and Museum. And she was also a missionary kid in Thailand. And she graduated from Wheaton College. And so for um, a young woman looking to enter into ministry, what is some advice or guidance that you could see Ruth Graham giving to a person like her? Mm. Wow. What a great question. Ruth, are you out there anywhere? <laughs> mm. I think what she would say, you know, the lore mm -hmm. just goes on and on and, and um, it's kind of self-perpetuating stories that people tell. So I've tried very hard to, to stay away from that. Um, but uh, I don't, I think it is true that, um, I know it's true, Ruth read the Bible. She knew the Bible better than anybody around her. Um, and she read constantly. People will, will talk and write about Bibles just open around her house so that if she had a, a moment, she could, um, you know, dig into the scriptures um, and knew a lot. She didn't just, you know, on the fly read it, but she had a, an office at home and um, a couple of spaces at home in Little Piney Cove where she would study the Bible and study its interpreters from throughout church history. She was just incredibly knowledgeable. Um, so I would say, you know, she would, she would advise being just buried in the word. Um, and another thing that she did constantly was to pray. And mm -hmm. she prayed, if you happen to have a chance to go to the cove in Asheville, there's a prayer room that she, her design touches, this aesthetic from the, the little piney cove are, are sprinkled throughout the, the cove, the training center. Um, her her prayer room, and this is this, uh, this is a reliable story because um, this one of the um, folks who was involved in getting the cove together told me this story. Um, maybe other people have heard this too. But there's a there's a table that's low to the ground, so you sit you can sit on the floor and use this table. It's this kind of octagonal or um, table. And you can, you know, you have your Bible there and you can kneel and, and pray. And so Ruth, like, tested out the prayer table. And she, you know, had her, had her elbows. Man, was like, my elbows. What am I going to do with my elbows? So if you go there now, there's a cushion. <laughs> there's a, you know, this is, 
who thinks of stuff like that? But if you're going to be there for hours praying, mm -hmm. you want your, you don't want to be thinking about how your elbows hurt. So let's put a cushion there and people will maybe <laughs> pray longer if their elbows are comfortable. Um, so prayer was a, was a huge part of her life. Um, and she, she, sometimes she wrote about it as just being in conversation with God and just constantly lifting up things that were happening with her children or with Billy's work or with her own um, sadness and frustration and loneliness. Um, so, you know, in, in some sense, it's not that complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in, a, in another sense, it's, a, it's the most complicated thing. Um, I would say if she has not read Ruth's poems, she could spend some time with Ruth's poems and write some of her own poems, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, that's great. I'm glad to know about that. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You can come either way. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, sir, but we're not taking any more questions. This is just a little itty bitty question. Oh dear. Um, would you, uh, you're writing the first critical, uh, by which I mean serious scholarly biography of Ruth, and uh, I'm wondering if you could comment, Anne, on why you think this has not been done. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it seems like such an obvious topic, and yet it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And then second, if you would talk a bit about the challenges and rewards that you've encountered uh, in, in this whole project. Okay. Thank you. There are a couple of reasons why I guess this has not been done. Um, in different, there are different layers of why. One, one is because she did not seek um, to be talked about. She did not seek the limelight. Um, strangely, you know, the, the older, sorry, the older she gets, the older she gets, the, the more, um, the more open she becomes about, um, her, her life. And she has some people who come along who, recognize her literary talent, her, um, just the, the interest that she um, uh, represented as a person, I'm not saying that right, uh, who began to kind of sponsor her and push her out into um, in publishing and um, mostly, mostly to get her poems out and to get her one wintry night book out. Um, so she wasn't a she wasn't ambitious for herself. Just to go back to your talk last night. Um, so that's part of it, and and folded into that is a generational um, component for women of her era who, you know what I'm kind of struggling with here is she was, she embraced the, um, the traditional help meet homemaker, mother, wife, um, nothing to see here. This is, this is just what we do. She embraced that role. Um, so for her, like what's interesting about that? The, the, Downside of that attitude is that for people looking in from the outside, and by people I mean historians, that doesn't always compute. <laughs> Sometimes historians are not really people. Um, but we have not paid attention to those, um, those stories. And you know, this is, I'm not saying anything that's revolutionary. But um, so as a, as a homemaking, child-rearing woman, what, is, what could possibly be the story? 
And again, to, to hark back to this idea of um, public activity, political activity is what matters, um, domestic activity just doesn't matter. It's just, it's all, it's all the same. You know, it's just, you know, wiping noses, wiping butts, that's it. Um, but over the past, what, 40 years, our understanding of what matters has gotten a little bit more, I know you hate this word, complicated, textured, deep. There's quite a lot to know about um, women, the domestic scene, that has everything to do with um, the, the stuff that's happening out in the quote unquote real world. So thankfully, um, you know, I think of Gerda Lerner's dissertation on the Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina Grimke. She wrote this as her dissertation, I think, and then um, realized that uh, she wanted to turn it into a book and nobody cared about this. And these were not stay-at-home women. These were abolitionist um, women's rights pioneers, as her, the title, subtitle of her book says. Um, but times changed, it took about maybe a decade, maybe not even that much, and then people were breaking her door down, we want to publish your book about the Grimke sisters, and now, you know, it's a classic. Um, so thankfully, I haven't had to be Gerda Lerner, because we would be getting nowhere. Um, I'm not Gerda Lerner. Um, there's a, we're in a moment where a book like this starts to make some more sense. Um, this is way more, and you, you're just, Grant, you're too nice. You kind of set me up. So um, another complication about this, about this topic is um, not only was Ruth a very private person, but her family is very private on her behalf. Um, and I guess this folds into the question of what, what have I learned? What have I, what's something about that? Okay, so this is kind of a reward. Um, so, you know, I started this project an eternity ago and um, have been very discouraged at many points along the way with the difficulty slash impossibility of getting people who knew Ruth to share with me experiences, stories, Etc. Ephemera, you know, I, I'll take anything. Um, and I guess I, I finally realized, huh, you know, if somebody were trying to write, somebody I didn't know, were trying to write a book about my own mother, who's alive and well and still, you know, making history down in South Carolina, um, I would be, eh, I'd be a little leery of that. And I guess that's given me a much more dynamic sense of historical actors. Like, she's not a historical actor, she's just my mom. Um, and I know a lot about my mom that I don't want anybody else to know. Uh, so, you know, trying to kind of make that connection and have some empathy for the position that, that the family is in, um, I, have, I have total respect for that. If she um, did not want to be in the limelight, I have some ethical struggle still with putting her in the limelight. Um, and I, I haven't figured that out. But I do, not to get, get woo-woo, um, uh, I, I just feel like this is, this is a project that I'm meant to be working on. So I just kind of, you know, um, poke my way along and um, it's, it's what I do. So, is that? Well, thank you all. Um, we will reconvene at 3.15 here for the final session of the symposium, a roundtable on Billy Graham and American evangelicalism. Let's thank Dr. Wells again. Thank you.